important decisions to make on November 8th, tonight's forum will give you an opportunity to learn before you vote. The questions for tonight's forum were submitted by District 10 residents and community or organizations. Now let's begin. So um, we will start off with 90 second opening statements in the alphabetical, alphabetical order. Uh, welcome candidates and thank you for participating in this forum. Uh, please introduce yourself, tell us which neighborhood you live in and why you are running for District 10 supervisor. Um, Brian, you may go first. Thank you so much and good evening to everyone. My name is Brian Sam Adam. I live inside the Petrero Hill neighborhood inside District 10, running to be District 10 supervisor. Uh, to try and better represent the district. The district is very diverse. Uh, as many as 30% of families speak a language other than English at home. A voter turnout is low in a variety of elections. And I just wanna bring uh, someone to this office that will make their best effort to try and represent the diversity of this community and also fight every day for issues like building more housing, supporting public transit, and making our streets a little bit safer. I know for myself, I have been an active volunteer in the community, uh, volunteering basically every weekend with the SF Marin Food Bank, and recently with the uh, Dog Patch and Northwest Petrero Hill Green Benefit District, supporting their recent music events that have been happening in the area, and just trying to bring that kind of help all around the community to the different neighborhoods inside District 10, and trying to bring a better quality of life and an easier to live experience inside San Francisco, and with that, I'm Looking forward to this conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. You can, you can applause. <laughs> now, uh, Shimon. Thank you so much. And first of all, good evening. I want to thank the Women League of Voters for having this forum this evening. And also thank you to everyone who attended. I am Shimon Walton, current president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. I live in Bayview Hunters Point. I'm a Bayview Hunters Point native and have also had the privilege of living in Petrero Hill as well at a young age. I am running for re-election because I know that we have issues in San Francisco around affordability with people experiencing homelessness and public safety. And I'm someone who has worked hard to address all of those areas, including fighting hard for the education of our young people. I'll talk more about some of the things that we've done over the past four years and of course the things we have to continue to build off of, but fighting for equity, making sure that all of our residents have an opportunity to be successful and take advantage of the great city of San Francisco is something that I've been fighting for and will continue to fight for. When we talk about affordable housing, when we talk about jobs and employment, when we talk about economic and recovery from the pandemic, when we talk about open space, when we talk about making sure that we keep people safe, when we talk about every issue that we have concerns about transportation, illegal dumping, quality of life issues. I am someone who not only talks about solutions, but has worked hard with all of you, as well as my colleagues and city leadership to address those needs and concerns. And we will continue to stay 100% focused on addressing the needs of the residents of District 10 and across San Francisco. Thank you. So now on to questions. Um, question one, how can District 10 save water and what are your plans for water conservation? Um, Shaman. Thank you so much for the question. Well, one, all of us, of course, can do a better job of water consumption. So the time of the day that we take showers, how long we take showers. Uh, if you have agriculture or grass, uh, of course you can switch and do things like have certain type of safe, environmentally friendly, astral turf, but we have to do things that are gonna allow us to reduce the consumption of water, and those are just a couple of steps. Uh, one of the things that we also can do around water conservation is to change the type of water heaters that we have, uh, change the, the, the settings on our water heaters to make sure that they're not set to a level where water consumption and the flow is, is too heavy and too high. That's always been an issue of concern and has led to those issues. Being in a drought, we know that not only conserving water is important for, for making sure that we are, are able to continue to have greenery, et cetera, but also it's important for our environment because at the end of the day, we are in a drought and we need to make sure that we do everything to use the water that we have in, in, a, in a better fashion. So how we use water in terms of water consumption, 
again, less showers, uh, making sure that we, if we have lawns and agriculture, we do water at, at different times a day and not do it on a consistent basis because that has been a major issue with water consumption is overuse of water and that is why we are, are depleting the water that we have, especially in the drought. Thank you. Uh, Brian? Thank you for the question. I would agree with Board President Walton in that there are many opportunities for individuals to change their individual water consumption, but I think it's important to stress that inside San Francisco, the average person uses 45 gallons of water per day, which is actually much lower than the rest of the Bay Area. Inside the Bay Area, on average, people use 90 gallons of water per day. In the state of California, it's around 100 gallons of water per day. So already, San Francisco is kind of leading the pack when it comes to water conversation or conservation. I think what we can bring is what we're already seeing inside the neighborhoods. People are installing or planting more vegetation that can deal with the dry weather because I think that this drought is kind of, it's a part of global climate change. It's a part of our changing environment inside of California. When we look at the water reservoirs all around the state and the amount of snow melt that's available for us to use for agriculture, that's available for us from Hetch Hetchy and other places inside the state. Uh, the Lawrence Laboratory in Berkeley is saying, you know, there's less water. And so they're working on ways to capture that snow melt because it's melting sooner than we usually have it available for agriculture. And what we will start seeing is it will impact our, the economy of the state of California and its ability. And what does that mean for us here? I think that we continue supporting the programs that already exist with places like PUC. There's lots of programs and tax write-offs to make upgrades to homes. There are things like the Water Stewardship Grant just this year. Uh, the Dejaro Block Garden was awarded a water, stu water stewardship grant for a garden they installed, and things like that can help support our water usage inside San Francisco. Thank you. Uh, question two, um, do you have plans for clinics that will provide mental health services similar to the Bayview Hunters Point Foundation? Brian first. Thanks for that question. I think that it goes without saying that we should support the creation of more mental health clinics. Uh, before I came to San Francisco, I had the opportunity to intern with State Assemblyman Evan Lowe, who represents parts of the South Bay and San Jose. And during that time, I did policy research related to K-12 through mental health education. Uh, at that time, I had the opportunity to do some research and discussions with a variety of schools inside the San Jose School Unified District that had just established a lot of new counseling that had been awarded, they'd been awarded grants from the Unified School District to, or rather the state government to basically provide mental health counseling and mental health services where there were none before. And I think when it comes to our schools and when it comes to the mental health services that are available to individuals, there's a lot to gain in providing those mental health services because our health insurance doesn't always cover it. And when it comes to our schools, you know, there's not always enough counselors to support all of our pupils. So we need to expand the funding for that and we need to expand the availability of mental health services because mental health is a part of your physical health. And if you aren't well in the head, you won't, you won't be well in the body. So I do have, if elected, I certainly have plans to expand support for mental health services and the creation of mental health clinics inside District 10 and throughout San Francisco. Thank you, Shimon. Well, one, definitely supportive of creating more opportunities to provide mental health services. One of the things I have done as a member of the Board of Supervisors is put millions of dollars in mental health and wellness support uh, for all communities, whether it be through the DreamKeeper initiative, whether it be making sure that nonprofits like the Bayview Hunters Point Foundation, Rafiki Center, uh, Westside Community Services, all of these organizations that provide mental health support for all communities across San Francisco. But not just those nonprofits, we've also worked with communities who haven't always receive your typical support, like your Pacific Islander community, making sure that they have the resources to support their residents and, and, and folks in community, because at the end of the day, San Francisco is a very, very diverse community, very diverse city, and so one, it's not just, it's easy to just talk about supporting mental health and wellness supports, but most certainly, I fought to make sure millions of dollars flow into the support, the services that provide mental health for everyone in, in San Francisco, and we'll continue to do that. It's a big part of what we wanna do when we respond to people who are experiencing homelessness. It's a big part of the work that we've been doing around safety and violence prevention, because we understand that mental health and wellness is at the top of the list for making sure that someone is whole and in a position to make better decisions and have the support that they need. So yes, we support more opportunities like the Baby Hunters Point Foundation. We've put millions of dollars to support that, but also we'll continue to work with our clinics as well as our entire community to get more resources for more mental health 
support. I'm sorry, your time is up. Uh, question three, um, what are your plans to help people in recovery and how will you help them reintegrate into society? Shaman? Thank you. Uh, so I, I come from the school of understanding that harm reduction, one, is a major way to support and help people who may suffer from issues with substance abuse because sometimes folks need a place to be where they can be safe, uh, where they won't cause, to, cause harm to anyone while you work with them to try to get them to understand the negative effects of addiction and being uh, a part of uh, someone who's experiencing substance abuse. But I also do believe in abstinence. I do have family members who have been in recovery for decades, uh, some of them in this audience as we speak right now, and abstinence has worked for them. So harm reduction is a, is a major way to support people. I do believe in safe consumption sites, have been fighting to make sure that we have one in San Francisco. But most certainly, uh, every approach does not work for everyone. One size fit, fits all does not work with addiction. And so there are also abstinence programs that we support. Uh, we've put, again, more resources into making sure that people who are suffering from addiction have places to live and receive on-site wraparound services to help them with, with addiction, but also to help them get jobs, get employment, and to maintain healthy lifestyles and be able to thrive in San Francisco. So I will continue to bo support both approaches and make sure that they are heavily resourced so that at the end of the day, we can lead people to leave safe lives uh, and substance abuse free. Thank you, Brian. In this regard, I agree with Board President Walton. I think that what's important to recognize when it comes to things like harm reduction, it's just one tool in the toolbox, and a one-size-fits-all approach will not make everything work out better. I know that when it comes to helping people that are dealing with substance abuse, that many people bring up conservatorship. They talk about how conservatorship is this one tool that's been locked away that's just too difficult to use. But I'd stress from the studies that are out there about what conservatorship can do for us for helping people that are currently dealing with substance abuse issues and mental health problems at the same time, that when people are put into these conservatorships, we see results. While they're in conservatorship, we see people are able to tackle their substance abuse problems. They are stable. But once they're removed from conservatorship, when they don't have any family support, when they're basically thrown back out to fend for themselves just as an individual, when they lack that support, when they're not integrated in community, when they're not integrated with their family, that they lapse back into substance abuse, that their mental health problems flare up again. So I think one big thing is that we do need a holistic set of support, and that comes in the form of supportive housing, that comes in, like poor President Malton mentioned, jobs programs and other training. We basically need as many tools in our toolbox to provide that specific, unique response to each individual that's dealing with whatever issues they happen to have. And if we treat everybody the same, if we think everybody's problems will be solved with the same set of tactics, you know, we're just gonna see the same thing we've been seeing. I'm sorry, your time is up, thank you. Um, question four, uh, what will you do to increase access to mental health care and decrease the stigma surrounding mental health? Brian? Thank you for this question. I think it's a great one. I think we have two real strong tools available to us. One, working with the Department of Public Health and the different communication arms of San Francisco City government, we can try to raise awareness about mental health. There's all kinds of education programs and public education campaigns that are going on in the city that are trying to make things change. On BART, uh, on BART we see a lot of programs trying to bring attention to violence on the trains to bring attention to sexual harassment on the trains. And kind of shining a light on these things makes people start thinking about them. And I think when it comes to mental health, once we take it out of maybe like very private conversations or people feel afraid to bring these things up for fear of being considered damaged, not totally well, fear, fearing that it will harm their job prospects. When I think about the work that I've done currently working for the city related to racial equity, part of it has been bringing conversations about race and equity in the city to the forefront so people are not so afraid to discuss discrimination, micro inequities, microaggressions, anything they see in the workplace. So we can actually start bringing that change. For mental health, it's the same thing. Starting these conversations to recognize that people can experience these issues and that once we start talking about it, we'll start doing something about it. Then the next step is making sure we actually have the funds. Uh, in the past several years, there have been a lot of attempts to kind of mandate the requirement that health insurance covers mental health, I think we can start right away in San Francisco to kind of providing those things baseline 
and then working with state I'm level sorry, legislators. I'm sorry, your time is up, Shaman. Thank you. Being a member of a community that most certainly has stigma around mental health, it's important to understand the root causes of why certain communities of color in particular have concerns around the stigma around mental health. So you have to, of course, outreach, learn what the issues and concerns are, and make sure you present it in a manner that it's about helping you and it's not about deeming everyone to be crazy. That's why we use terms like wellness now versus mental illness because the stigma around it is also associated with the language around it. Another reason why communities of color and people have a stigma around mental health and wellness support is because it's typically connected to the institutions that harm their communities, uh, the justice system, sometimes in some cases at school districts. And so we have to also make sure that those institutions that are responsible for making sure people are healthy and successful are also doing their job around providing the right support. And most certainly, we, we can make sure that uh, healthcare systems fund mental health and fund it fully, just like they fund any other aspects of, of your health overall, because mental health and wellness is a big part of a whole human being, and most certainly, making sure that the, that medical insurance that's provided through your employer or provided through your parents' employers are also providing that mental health and wellness, but that stigma that exists is really connected to a lot of the institutions uh, and the people, quite frankly, that have harmed certain communities for a long time. Thank you for your response. Question five, what are your plans to create career opportunities for our youth? Shimon? So one of the things we've made sure as, as District 10 supervisor is continuing to provide the resources that go into our Office of Economic and Workforce Development, that go to our nonprofit providers that provide workforce development services. More recently, I just reinstituted the Workforce Alignment Committee at the Board of Supervisors, which existed while I was serving as an executive director of a workforce development organization. And that committee is really focused on working with all city departments to make sure there's alignment with the definition of what workforce development is, making sure that the resources are going to the right places to build pathways, to build skills of people who need employment. I also fought very hard for local mandatory hire on construction projects to make sure that people who are from San Francisco and live in San Francisco are also well paid on the jobs right in their own community. I'm working on legislation right now to provide local hire for tech companies uh, and companies that have been taken advantage of, and, and quite frankly, residents of, of this city uh, and members of this city. And so I will continue not only to provide funding, continue not only to make sure pathways and pipeline programs are in place, uh, but also make sure that we build off of the opportunities that have not existed, like some more local mandatory laws. Uh, also wrote a resolution when I was on the Board of Education that provided a pathway into education careers with the school district, and those things are still in place. So workforce has always been a priority and we'll continue to support it. Thank you. Uh, Brian? For myself, I think the way I think about workforce development in San Francisco comes a lot from my experience working for the city. I think when it comes to hiring, there has been a lot of conversations and there are a lot of opportunities to kind of reform the hiring process. Right now, there's a lot of strict guidelines on how we hire and who we hire, even though there are lots of career, way, career pathway programs and a lot of uh, opportunities, whether internship opportunities or pathways to careers that exist in different departments. I think that we have a chance to basically push to bring more training from the actual city departments. Right now, it's only a handful of city departments that really have the resources and commitment to kind of bring people on and are willing to train them and make them professionals without having to take on the private cost of going two, four years at a university. Right away, they can start learning. Right away, they can have an income. And right away, they can be contributing something and expanding their skill set and then pursue whatever they'd like to see. I think what we can do to do, what we can, what we can do to achieve that is work with city government to reform the process, make our hiring more streamlined so that we are willing to take on the cost of educating and employing people that live in our community right now, rather than setting up requirements and kind of saying, you know, up to the individual, like, you know, you do this and then we'll see you when you're done. I think right now we can expand what we're already doing in our outreach, reach out to students inside the San Jose Unified, San Francisco Unified School District and people in the community and employ them. Thank you. And um, question six. Now, this is a really long question. Um, what are your plans to address and take action 
on the, on the pollution and blight in Bayview Hunters Point, India Basin. Specifically, Recology's mounds of uncovered, unwatered, crushed cement hills on Amador, comma, the shipyard, comma, and the blight caused by neglect of business, businesses, including the city uh, San Francisco Fire Department and City College on Evans. Um, Brian, yeah, Brian. <laughs> okay, this is a great question. I know I've heard a lot about legal dumping and other concerns related to the uncovered trash and dust and all the negative things that come with that. I think one big thing is the city has a variety of programs for people to kind of voluntarily say, you know, I've abandoned the building, sorry. And there's a list that the city keeps of like, look at all these abandoned businesses, look at all these abandoned homes, et cetera. I think there's an opportunity to kind of ramp up the attention we bring to these things. Uh, there's already things on the ballot that are bringing attention to these some of these kinds of things. I think what we can do is highlight where there is neglect in the city, bring more attention to it, bring some consequences potentially to the property owners that are neglecting their duty to people in the community in their neglect of their own properties. And I think that when it comes to illegal dumping, there are opportunities to increase enforcement or bring in measures that will discourage people from dumping. That could potentially be signs, we already have lots of illegal dumping signs all throughout neighborhoods in District 10 in every language, basically. And the installation of cameras can also help to discourage some people. I think one big concern can come from maybe people outside of the community, outside of San Francisco, coming in and dumping trash in, in a community they don't live in. And I think there are other opportunities to expand funding for communities to take things into their own hands without necessarily relying 100% on volunteer hours. One example would be a community benefit district or a green benefit district to increase funding for paying to clean up neighborhoods. And Thank you. Your safe. time is up. Uh, Shimon? One of the things we've done upon being elected was join the Bay Area Air Quality Management District to make sure that I was learning about all of the tools that we have to enforce quality air to make sure that our communities are safe. Uh, since I've been on Beckman, we've been able to institute fines for companies like Recology, make sure that they are permitted to do work and actually moving companies from where they are and putting in cease and desist orders. So several companies who were polluting areas, not only around cement plants, but also in the candlestick area, have been given cease and desist orders in order to not operate in our community. Uh, some of you may know we just had a hearing on the civil grand jury report about sea level rise and groundwater and what that will do to pollution on the shipyard if it's not fixed. One thing I can guarantee that if the shipyard is not 100% clean, we will not be transferring the land to the city. Uh, we also, upon being elected on the shipyard, make sure that there was a committee that was in place of residents working directly with the Navy so that they could get information in real time. And one of the most important things that we've done since there has been development on parcel A on the shipyard where they try to say that there's no contamination, regardless of, of that, we require soil testing on parcel A at any site that they were attempting to build and make sure that that was in place before any other buildings went up. And we are going to be providing a response to the civil grand jury report on the 29th, so stay tuned because there's more to come. Thank you. Uh, question seven, what is your definition of affordable housing, Shaman? So for me, affordable housing from a formal definition standpoint is to make sure that families and individuals are not paying more than a third of their income towards their housing. We know that once you start paying more than a third of your income towards your housing, then it also leads to other insecurities like food insecurities, not being able to pay all of your bills, not being able to provide transportation for you and your family. And so a third, no more than a third of your income should go on paying your rent and paying, paying uh, for a mortgage. But at the end of the day, we also know that in a city like San Francisco, where income disparities are major, and, and, and people are not able to afford to pay rent here, that that's, that may not even be enough. So we also need to make sure that we go as low as we can on AMIs. Some of the housing that we have pushed for, not only in District 10 across the city, go to AMI levels as low as 30%, uh, between 30 and 80%, but the fact of the matter is, we've also rezoned to ensure 100% affordable 
projects in District 10. So whether it be the 100% affordable housing projects that are coming to Candlestick, the ones that are coming at Homeless Prenatal Program uh, on Portrayal, the increased levels of affordability that we get at Pier 70, the power station, those are because of the battles and the fights that we make sure happen as your representative of District 10 because it is hard to live in San Francisco and to afford it, and so no more than a third of your income should be going towards rent, and in most cases, even lower than that. Thank you. Brian? For me, I also agree that affordable housing, if we go by the dictionary, it's got to be at or below 30% of your income, any more than that, and you're cost burdened. And unfortunately, for many San Francisco residents right now, they are cost burdened uh, for a variety of incomes. And I think that what we need to see is the expansion of housing, and we need to push for measures that basically keep housing affordable. Right now, a lot of measures, a lot of the focus is on streamlining the process, on changing the rules to increase opportunities to build more in particular places. I think that's just one piece of the puzzle. If that's the only tool we bring to build this, it's, it's not gonna work out because when we look towards the rest of the Bay Area, San Francisco included, when we look at the regional housing needs allocation, basically the Association of Bay Area Governments tells all the cities, you know, build this diverse set of housing. Build affordable housing, build median income housing, build above median income housing. When it comes to above median income housing, 120% AMI and above, every city in the Bay Area, they show up, they've got A pluses, they're very good. But for everything else, from median to affordable, they all get big Fs, they can't deliver. They don't make any affordable housing and they really struggle. So even in San Francisco, where in the past five years we've seen permits for maybe several thousand affordable uh, developments, that's still barely 50% of the goals that were set for us. So I think we need to expand the housing and also make sure we ensure there are programs in place to cap the cost. Thank you. Um, next question, uh, question number eight, uh, kind of a segue. Uh, what is your plan to increase access to affordable housing in San Francisco, Brian? That's a great follow-up question. I think that expanding affordable housing, one tool in the box is to build more housing, but more of this housing has to be affordable by definition. If we leave it solely to the market, you know, we've kind of been living in the market, and the market is not really creating affordable housing. When we look at rents in San Francisco, they've slowly been trending down in the past five years, especially due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but they're they're trailing back up. Property values will keep going up. And if anyone actually wants to become a homeowner in San Francisco, it means the cost of your monthly mortgage is also going to go up. So I think we need to not only build more, but expand the programs that cap cost and also continue funding the programs that help people become change from being renters to homeowners. So the homeowner support loan programs, different programs provided by the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development that help renters living in the city become homeowners. We need to expand support for them while building more housing and while working to bring down the cost of housing in general. And what that means is that for people that own multiple properties in the city, that they have to bring their properties onto the market or they have to sell them rather than having you know, housing that's basically an asset that housing should become housing for somebody else. That's what I think, at least. Thank you. Shaman? So one of the things we've done, again, is push for maximum level of affordability on projects, not only in District 10, but also across the city. But when we talk about access to affordable housing, there's one thing that, if you go back to the policy position we put when we ran for office in 2018, we said that we would do something to make sure that the city also developed its own affordable housing. And so we put Prop I on the ballot, and now millions of dollars are available for the city to build affordable housing and social housing on its own. So we have to, one, make sure that those resources go 100% to building and creating affordable housing. Two, we also need to make sure that affordable housing is built diversely across San Francisco. There are certain areas in the city where we're not building, where we're not building affordable housing, and that has been a major problem. We develop in District 10. I can point to the thousands of projects and the thousands of homes that we have on the way, 
but now we have to work together with the rest of the city to start building in other areas across San Francisco. And the only way to do that is to bring community together and let them understand the advantages of having affordable housing in their community. Why it's so important for us to work together to do that? Because otherwise, everyone is going to continue to suffer one from the disparities that exist, but this city will turn into a city where nobody can afford to live except for the people who are already house rich, and that's something that we have to make sure that we avoid. Thank you. Question nine, what are your plans to increase access and affordability to high quality child care in your community? Shimon? Well, someone who was a major fighter of Prop C to make sure that we had millions of dollars that go directly to funding quality child care. Uh, I've also started meeting with providers monthly to listen to their needs and concerns and make sure that the early child care community has the, the proper training and supports that they need to take care of our young people. When we talk about affordability and we talk about affordable housing, one of the things we also been working on is to make sure that any new community that is built, any new affordable housing that is built prioritizes making sure that there's a child care center on site making sure that there's a space in place for our young people to go because that has to be a part of community and has to be built in. And we have to do more for our in-home care providers because a lot of our smaller communities have a lot of in-home care providers that are not receiving the resources and support they need to thrive and continue. And so some of our bigger centers have taken away those children, but the reality of it is the need still exists for these working moms, these working fathers, these working families that live in close proximity to these in-home centers but don't necessarily live close enough to some of your bigger child care centers like your Head Start programs, like the, the, the child care centers we ye might operate. Our in-home providers are a major part of our child care network system, so we have to make sure the resources that we have, resources that we have, Prop C, also go to support them and provide the training and assistance that they need. But the big thing is making sure that more sites are available, more access is available to Thank the Thank you. We need to move on to the next uh, person. Brian? So with regards to early child care and prenatal care and providing care for younger children inside the community, I, I largely agree with Board President Walton. I think that with most people, because many people in San Francisco are cost burdened, people do have to be working all the time despite the fact that they have children to raise or may be pregnant. I think one big thing is making sure that we continue to provide the resources we do have and expand support for them so that people can actually access them if they're because of the, the prohibitive costs. Not everybody can afford or has access to something like a flexible spending account set aside pre-tax dollars for this kind of stuff. I think we need to work with the Board of Education, work on having a kind of holistic process for our the Santa, uh, San Francisco Unified School District and just work with the Department of Public Health to kind of have a, a robust network that's integrated with child care providers, nonprofits, the services that are already provided by the city so that no matter what background you have in the city, you have access to a whole suite of services so that you can raise a family and still work in, work inside the city and basically kind of live the live the, live the life you want to live without having to you know, sacrifice here and there for whatever reason. Thank you. Um, question nine, do you have plans to create more jobs in this district? And if so, what would be some of your targets? What types of jobs and what would the average salary be? Brian. Interesting question regarding the salaries, but I think Coming to the issues that I support, I think when it comes to more housing, public safety, and better public transit, I think in all these fields, in addition to sustainability, there's opportunity to create a lot of jobs. Related to what I stated before with working with city government to kind of make it easier to bring people that are San Francisco residents to train them on the job, build those skills, and start paying them now to do good work for the city. I think that's something we can start doing. And expanding public transit, seeing more transit operators to make our system more reliable, have more frequent bus service. In some of the bus lines that run every single week, maybe only 10% of our bus lines have six buses or seven buses every hour, so a very high frequency. Most, or the average bus inside San Francisco maybe shows up three times per hour. If that seems good to you, all right. But I think there's an opportunity to expand that service. There's an opportunity to build more homes, build more homes that are not only sustainable, but are well integrated with our transit systems. And 
when it comes to public safety, I think there's an opportunity to have more community ambassadors and more non-police response to different 911 calls. I think that we could see people being employed from salaries ranging from 60,000 to $100,000 per year for some of these jobs, potentially bringing people on at 60 to 70,000 and slowly training them up because right now minimum wage is is you know not even minimum. If your goal was to not be cost burdened living on minimum, Thank good luck. Thank you for your response, uh, Shimon. Thank you. Job creation is really about bringing business into community. And so in order to create jobs, obviously we have to have employers that come into community. And so one of the things that has happened to us, what I'm really excited about, if you look at what has happened across San Francisco during the pandemic, on our corridors in District 10, a lot of growth took place versus going backwards. So we have a lot of new businesses on our Third Street corridor. We have a lot of new businesses that are on in Visitation Valley opening up because bringing business is how you create jobs. So if you look at the luckies that's on the way, if you look at having a grocery outlet, another grocery outlet on Bayshore, if you look at the improvements that have happened to Food Co, which has increased opportunities for employment, these are the types of things that help us create jobs. Also, something that I've worked on for quite amount of time and something that's going to be amazing benefit to all of us is when currently right now on the sewer system improvement program but certainly when that's finished more jobs coming into community if we look at what's happening at the Evan Street campus and City College and also what's happening with the Southeast Community f Facility being switched over to 1550 Evans we're working on a state-of-the-art education center we got money put in the bond through City College. And so when we get that career center built, that's also opportunity to train and, and create more opportunities for folks to go to work. But the big thing is continuing to bring businesses into our district, both small size and as, as large as possible that take care of community and provide benefits. Thank you. Uh, question 10, what policies would you propose to address chronic homelessness in San Francisco? Shimon? Addressing you know, people who are experiencing homelessness, particularly at the chronic level, it all starts, one, with affordability. This city is the worst when it comes to affordability, and so folks don't have an opportunity to be able to pay bills and pay rent, and unfortunately sometimes end up on the street. What we have done in District 10 is made sure that we have places for people to go that are not on the street while we work to provide them with permanent and supportive housing. And I would argue and say that no other district has stepped up in a way that we have to support people experiencing homelessness. We have three navigation centers. We have an RV site at Pier 94. We have a safe sleeping site in front of Mother Brown's. We have a vehicle triage center behind Candlestick because we worked hard to meet people where they are and get them off of the street. Then when you get people off the street, provide them with a safe place to stay, a safe place to sleep at night, you can start working on some of the barriers that exist and some of the reasons why they may be on the street. So whether it's employment, whether it's substance abuse issues, whether it's mental health uh, and wellness, those are the things that we've been able to do by providing the resources to have places for people to go. We saw a major increase of folks experiencing homelessness in the district during the pandemic, particularly folks living in vehicles. And now you've read several articles, you've seen the data, homelessness in District 10 in some areas across the city has decreased dramatically since we have started to open up a little bit from the pandemic. Thank you. Brian? I think with any chronic homelessness or addressing it, the, some of the policies you can see is really embracing the housing for us policy or mind of way of thinking. Right now, when it comes to Housing First, there's a lot of conversation about kind of giving people more hoops, that if people can't be absent for a certain amount of time, then they don't deserve a roof above their head. And I think that, you know, leaving people on the streets is basically just throwing more stumbling blocks in their way. Embracing Housing First, building more housing, more affordable housing, more supportive housing, you know, clears the runway to actually begin supporting people and like Board President Walton mentioned, homelessness has gone down in San Francisco. The problem is that there's just so much of it. Inside the Bay Area, there's maybe 24,000 unhoused people, and 60% of those people are either in San Francisco or San Jose. And so even though we've helped uh, around, you know, several hundred people in the past year uh, get into stable housing and kind of start tackling their problems, get employed, start having like more medical treatment, we basically need to see more of that to actually bring lasting change in the city. And a lot of that depends on having enough 
homes for all the people living in, a, in San Francisco. So not only do we need to continue supporting the programs that are already helping people that are struggling with chronic homelessness, but we need to bring more housing into San Francisco that's genuinely affordable. Thank you. Question 11. Both the affordability, sorry, it's the long. Both the affordability crisis and evictions have caused gentrification and widespread displacement. How do you plan to address preserving long established communities and the displacement of low income communities in San Francisco? Brian? I think a huge part of this right now what we're seeing a lot of is a lot of pushes to basically upzone, to change rules, to make it easier to build certain things, to try and clear the red tape for big developers to basically build more in certain communities. What we've seen in the past year, uh, some supervisors like Gordon Marr, Hilary Ronan, Mayor Leonard Breed sent a letter to uh, different Bay Area regional associations when they were putting together a transit plan for Plan Bay Area basically saying you know, like the history of like all, or all, the, all this affordable housing we're bringing, all these new developments we're, we're bringing, which is really just market rate development with some affordable window dressing, is you know hurting our communities. It's We're bringing in all this housing that's supposed to be helping people that are cost burdened, really we're pushing them out. So I think we need to bring more housing, but we need to continue support for making that housing affordable. Maybe that's rent vouchers, maybe that's capping out the price on some of these units. And I think part of that is making sure these units are not market rate, but are just affordable housing, and ensuring we have those protections for the community, and ensuring that when we're trying to cut the red tape, we're not cutting the red tape for communities that have historically been underserved and historically been ignored by these private developers. Because when it comes to bringing that housing in different parts of the city, where it's predominantly single family homes, where it's predominantly duplexes, where the rules are different, you know, they're, they're not gonna be fighting the same battles they're going to get a lot more attention and a lot more leeway in trying to get, protect their communities. Thank you, Shaman. We need a strong universal basic income program to provide additional resources for families. Again, we know San Francisco, the disparities in wealth are very large, and so universal basic income, providing some of our lowest income families with the additional resources each month is gonna help them, one, be able to pay rent and not be unhoused, but also be able to do more to take care of their family. And that's something that we've worked on. We've had pilot programs working with some of our mothers who are uh, expecting it and, ha and having children, providing them with those additional resources has been something that has helped them be able to maintain and sustain in this very expensive city. We need to continue to push for strong eviction protections and make sure that people are not being pushed out of their homes just because landlords want to do it on a whim, which happens in a lot of cases. And so we continue to make sure that happens. We need to continue to fund our free legal aid services and supports that keep families in their house. And some of the things that we've been able to do is create family relief for, for undocumented families, making sure that they have additional income each month, particularly during the pandemic, make sure that right to recovery was in place for families who were getting sick during the pandemic and they had that additional income. But a universal basic income program that provides additional support on top of people who are barely making ends meet on top of their salaries that they get right now is really going to be key to keeping people in homes and keeping people from being put out on the street and not being able to afford to live in San Francisco. Thank you. Question 12. Do you accept PAC funding from outside California? And if so, from who and why? Shaman. I have not accepted PAC funding to my knowledge outside of California. I could say that I probably would most definitely uh, accept uh, resources from labor unions, et cetera, that may not exist in the state, but most certainly share the same values uh, that I do as I work closely with labor leadership and folks who are gonna make sure that our, our residents have an opportunity to have quality jobs, have benefits, have sick pay, and are, are protected when they're in the workforce. So to my knowledge, I have not, but I most certainly would accept money from a, a PAC that was connected to, to a labor union. Thank you. Brian. I have not accepted any money from out of the state of California political action committees. <laughs> Thank you. Um, question 13. What are your top community safety concerns for your district? Brian. I think for top community safety concerns, it really varies neighborhood by neighborhood, even with inside District 10. I think that 
Some neighborhoods may be experiencing more gun violence, and I think in those cases, we've already seen some positive results for things like the Dreamkeeper Initiative, continuing support for these programs, reaching people that are considered at risk, and making sure that they're given support and other opportunities that lower the chance of potential violence happening is a positive thing. I think in what we've already discussed with different kinds of wraparound programs and expansion of childcare and employment opportunities, some of those things are just, could be after school programs, ensuring that there's things to do after school, uh, lowering the chance of uh, youth potentially committing certain kinds of crimes. I think in other parts of the neighborhood, people may be more concerned with theft or trash in the neighborhood. I think when it comes to those things, ha expanding different kinds of foot patrols so that there's m just more people in areas discourages the discourages certain kinds of crimes. When people know they're being watched, when they know there may be consequences, they're less likely to do something. And I think that there are opportunities to expand community ambassadors to bring more attention and bring more care to our commercial corridors just to make people feel safe at all times and to discourage uh, different kinds of crime that are affecting local businesses and to also bring people onto public transit where they may feel fear of being assaulted or whatever else they may fear seeing on public transit. Thank you. Shaman? Most definitely the most devastating type of violence in community is gun violence and that is major to a lot of residents here in a district. Uh, one of the things that we have done is put together an extensive District 10 safety plan, and we did that talking with every community in the district, so we have forms in Petrell Hill, forms in Bayview Hunters Point, forms in Visitation Valley, forms with the Dog Patch community. We talked about the major issues that exist for them, what they wanted to see corrected, and how they wanted to see it addressed, and then we put the plan together working with the Public Defender District Attorney's Office, with our community, with the police department, and of course it was community-led. Gun violence was identified as a major type of violence. Uh, pedestrian and traffic safety was something that was really big on, on everyone's plates. Obviously, we've instituted a lot of traffic calming work and continue to work with community to address those needs and concerns. Speed bumps have gone up, quick build projects are in the making, and we have finished some and we're gonna continue to do that, but the thing that we need to do to address violence is bring community together, look at the issues in each neighborhood and each area, and make sure that those solutions are fitting to what people have presented. And we know that in some cases, having the right type of community foot patrols, we know that community ambassadors, which we have increased funding for, MTAP officers on MTA and Muni lines, which we have increased funding for, making sure officers speak the language of the community they serve, which we have increased funding for, those types of things are what our community has identified. Thank you. Uh, question 14, uh, this is a long one again. According to the city's own figures, it will cost 19 billion over the next eight years to build the affordable housing required by the state's regional housing needs allocation goals. Where will that money come from? And how do we balance opportunities for market rate housing against the state requirements for affordable housing? Shaman. So first of all, the state goals are crap. Um, at the end of the day, in San Francisco, we build more housing than the rest of our region, and they gave us an inflated goal that probably is gonna be impossible for us to reach, even if we streamline everything in front of us. But what the state needs to do is stop blocking our shovel-ready shovel projects that we have in place when we need more tax increment dollars to support our projects. We have affordable housing units ready to go ready to break ground right now that are not able to be financed because the state won't provide us the tax increment dollars that are needed, but they'll fund projects in other parts of the state that are still in the making, that are not ready to break ground. So if the state is gonna have arena goals like that, they need to provide the resources and support for us to at least make an attempt to reach those goals that, that are not gonna be achieved. And also they need to hold the entire region accountable. We are building more housing than most of the region, and yet we have this inflated number that is inequitable, and quite frankly, it's unrealistic. So what I'm gonna continue to do is push for, make sure that uh, fully funded and prop I, we put a $600 million bond for housing in place a few years ago, gonna make sure that the resources to continue to build those affordable projects, those projects that are mixed, uh, that they're able to happen, but most certainly it'll be a struggle to reach that uh, completely ignorant goal for San Francisco. Thank you. Brian? Well, I have to agree with 
uh, Board President Walton, and that the goals are kind of unfair. Largely, the regional housing needs allocation are focused on basically keeping every city in the Bay Area the same. So whatever small incremental growth they see, they're like, yeah, just build that many houses, I guess. So they expect cities like San Jose and San Francisco to maybe build tens of thousands of new units, and then Marin County can get away with maybe seeing 500 new units for five years. So, you know, right now, the Association of Bay Area Governments is not really like a, they don't have a lot of power over the cities. They make recommendations, but what they can do is hold San Francisco hostage. They can basically deny us funding. They can threaten us to say like, you know, we're gonna step in and start laying down the law inside your city. And I think the big thing to work on is to try and work with the other cities inside the Bay Area and make them have more housing. Right now, there's all kinds of conversations going on in San Mateo County, Santa Clara County, where people are actively fighting new housing with all kinds of catchphrases and ways to make it sound right. They're fighting for the environment. They're fighting housing to protect the environment, maybe. They're fighting the housing to protect narrow roadways. They're saying, we don't have emergency plans. If you bring more people into our community, what are, what are we going to do? So I think expanding our conversation outside of San Francisco, seeing opportunities to increase the density of other communities, rather than trying to maintain the status quo of incremental growth and holding us to this unreasonable standard of multiplying housing Thank and stuff. Thank you. Uh, question 15. Do you have a comprehensive plan to address transportation needs in D10, both for those trying to get around the city and those commuting outside the city, Brian? Uh, yes, I think I do have a comprehensive plan for dealing with this. I think when it comes to San Francisco right now, when we look at SoCal, not San Francisco, public transit ridership has been going way, way, way down. And there's so many people there, even though public transit ridership has been going up in the Bay Area, overall in the state of California, public transit ridership has just been taking a nosedive for the past 20 years. And I think what that says is just California is not, we have not built it to work on public transit. And when people, you know, people don't want to keep riding public transit because they don't feel dignified riding public transit. It's not convenient. It's not high enough frequency. It doesn't get you where you want to go. And once you get a car, you're like, why do I want to downgrade back to the bus or the train? So even though it's more sustainable, even though we can maybe see less traffic violence from car accidents, from cars hitting pedestrians or hitting bike riders, people don't want to ride public transit. We talk about how important it is, but nobody actually rides it. We throw money at it, but the buses are empty. I think when it comes to San Francisco, we need to expand service so that more of our bus lines are more frequent. And when it comes to the Bay Area as a whole, we need to work with Caltrain, with BART, with the other transit authorities to basically make people that basically drive their car every single day, whether they're going to work, to the beach, whatever it is, to replace some of those rides. Rather than trying to pull people that have upgraded from bus to car, try to pull back people that are always using their car to riding public transit to bring attention, to bring support Thank back you. to it. Thank uh, Shaman. We currently have several transportation plans in place for the district or plans that include uh, transportation that I definitely was a part of and played a role in. The Bayview Transportation Plan, the Eastern Neighborhoods Plan. Uh, soon we're gonna have a plan that's set up for, for Visitation Valley. So. The, the main thing that I'm trying to do is make sure that all of the plans that are, in pl are, that are in place to improve transportation, to connect us to our commercial corridor, to make sure transportation is faster, to make sure that folks can get to and from work uh, in, in our isolated communities are to make sure that th those are resourced. But also, we have also done some things that have never before happened uh, since we've been in office. You know, we stopped switchbacks on the T-line. We literally have families who were not getting taken home because they would switch back and go to the west side and they wouldn't make it to Sunnydale. Uh, we did bring a new bus line into the district. We got the 15 Express, which goes down 3rd Street through public housing and connects you to downtown. So those are things that we will continue to work on, getting more improvement on our transportation. There's some things you're gonna see around the T. Uh, there's some changes you're gonna see on some of our bus lines that run through community to make sure that they're more rapid, but also making sure that we have stops in areas where seniors and, and people need to get to school and, and get to work. So those plans are in place, but we're also doing things that have been outside the box, like stopping switchbacks, creating new lines, doing things that community has quite frankly asked for for a very long time. Thank you. Question 16. Affordable housing residents need affordable services. 
What additional affordable services are needed in the community, such as grocery stores, parks, and schools? And what are your plans to bring those to D10? Shaman? Well, I think you answered the question. Grocery stores, parks, schools, jobs. Uh, of course, we talked about it, child care. Uh, but one of the things we have done, uh, if you'll notice, we have a brand new grocery outlet on Bayshore I mentioned. Worked very hard to get a new Lucky store that's going to be opening in the next couple of months at the Bayview Plaza, which is going to replace the Walgreens. So many types of businesses tried to be in that space. We had to fight literally to make sure that the grocery store was actually going to be where it was coming into community. Uh, we've done something again that has never happened before. We have four parks on the bond right now. Four parks on the bond. Jackson Park, Hearst Playground, India Basin, and also we have parts of McLaren Park, which you know we share a border with. Because of your advocacy and community, making sure everyone understood how important our parks were, but because of us having the ability to be able to work with my colleagues, other city leadership, to make something like that happen. So yes, we need to make sure that our parks are beautified and bring quality grocery stores. And there are more grocery stores on the way because we have more space. Those same people we had conversations with to bring in Luckies are actually talking to us about other locations in the district. And we've improved so many parks. Casey Jones Playground, MLK Park, uh, the park up in Northridge, uh, Phelps Palou Playground, and we have several more parks that we're going to continue to work on that are outside of the bond because of our work with RPD and, again, because of community stepping up and saying what, what is needed. These things are happening on the daily right now. Thank you. Brian. I think some additional things. There are opportunities, I think, to bring alternative kinds of businesses into the neighborhood. I think when it comes to more worker-owned businesses and cooperatives, things like Rainbow Grocery, there are opportunities to support these businesses coming into the community by extending them special tax benefits all around the world, especially in places like Spain and Germany. They extend special benefits to these companies. And in San Francisco, we can potentially introduce a similar model so that we can lower the, the cost of business for these businesses and then have them basically employ primarily people within, the, within our communities and also share the profits and revenues of those businesses with people that are actually working for those companies and bringing more worker democracy into these things and bringing more affordability into the neighborhood. I think when it comes to green spaces, one thing or one challenge facing Rex and Park is the cost of maintenance. One way we can kind of balance this out outside of bonds or increasing taxes in different respects is expanding green benefit districts. Right now in San Francisco, there is one green benefit district. Uh, Green Benefit District basically just brings slightly higher property taxes in the area, but then the community has those dollars to basically do whatever they want related to maintaining those parks, cleaning up graffiti, cleaning up the streets, having community ambassadors walk around, hosting events inside the community, or providing other services. I think this kind of stuff can pool resources into the community where otherwise, you know, one family or two families Thank might not you. have that. Thank uh, you. Question 17. How are you going to meet the needs of constituents of the new D10 district after the recent redistricting process? How are you planning to bridge the gap between different neighborhoods? Brian. I think bridging the gaps in a very diverse community like District 10, where you have 30% of families speaking a language other than English at home, and just a, literally you know, the biggest district when it comes to, to size, I think it all comes down to showing up and having a team or being able to speak, having a team that speaks all the languages or being able to speak some of the languages that the community speaks, showing up to events, sharing your time, hearing the community, working on those problems. I think because the community is so diverse, they have diverse needs, diverse concerns. I think just having the time to show up, interface with that community, understand what's going on, Without that, there's going to be no way to meet the needs of communities from Potrero Hill, Dog Patch, all the way to Viz Valley, Little Hollywood, and the Bayview, Hunters Point neighborhood. I think for myself, I've just been focused on showing up, volunteering, participating in different events, and bringing what I know, or just being there to support things. I think if elected, I do the same thing. Thank you. Shaman? So I think from a size standpoint, we actually shrunk as a district. 
um, and we lost some of the space that we did have. But with that said, we're still a very diverse district. We have several communities that, quite frankly, are separated by freeways and other land barriers. One of the things we've already done was we work to bring all of our merchants associations together, meet with them periodically, talk about the challenges across the district and what they need. I'm so thankful that Brian said we need to have an office that is reflective of the languages that people speak in community. We have Cantonese, Mandarin, Spanish available in our office because we know and understand the diverse needs of the district, which quite frankly have always been the case. And so it's been very important that we are able to work with all of our communities. I talked about earlier providing resources to make sure that we have hubs in our communities, not just the black community, not just the Latino community, not just the Asian community, but also our Pacific Islander community. No one has ever put the hundreds of thousands of dollars into the Pacific Islander community like they deserve. Please refrain from applause. Since, since, we have, since we have come into the district, because I understand that representation matters for everyone in the district. And so I'm gonna do everything that I can to make sure that not only language services are provided for all communities, but cultural services are provided for all communities, and that every possible service that is provided for communities looks like the communities that they are serving. That's something I 100% try to fight for on a daily basis and will continue to do. Thank you. Question 18, what are your priorities in terms of the shipyard site, in terms of prioritizing cleanup activities? Shaman? So number one priority, I said this on record almost 1,000 times by this point, the number one priority is 100% clean shipyard, 100% clean. The Navy is responsible to make sure that that shipyard is 100% clean, and that will continue to be the priority to push the Navy, to push the Environmental Protection Agency, to push all of our federal, mental, federal government agencies that are responsible for cleanup to do just that. And while we're working on that, of course, we continue to require things like additional soil testing before you build on parcel A. We just, again, as I talked about before, had a hearing on the civil grand jury report. We will have a response um, at our next GAO meeting at the, at, at, at the hearing on Thursday to talk about exactly what we wanna do in response of that report. But you can most certainly bet that we're gonna be pushing for more increased staff that are, are, are going to do more monitoring and provide a higher level of research for some of the issues that have been presented that we know exists on the shipyard. This is a space that I, my community is from. I lost both of my grandparents to cancer who lived adjacent to the shipyard. So for me, the most important thing is 100% clean shipyard. Not supporting people's lawsuits, not looking after people who are not concerned about the health and well-being of our community, but 100% clean shipyard. Thank you, Brian. I think uh, in this on this issue, I'm lined up with Board President Walton. I think the big thing is talking about the clean shipyard report from the civil grand jury that was released earlier this year, when they called out the mayor's office and different city departments on a number of respects. The mayor's office came back and basically said, "We disagree on almost everything." And they basically said, you know, we're doing a very good job. You just haven't been paying close enough attention. And I think that what we can bring in the Board of Supervisors is basically, you know, continuing to try and hold the city accountable, hold different government agencies accountable, and keeping them in touch with the community, not just kind of, you know, they sent us a letter saying, you know, we are talking to the community. The Navy is working very hard talking to the community. They're involved in the process and kind of, you know, being a little critical of that, making sure that they are st we're keeping them honest, and you know, when they kind of give us lip, that we're still able to come back and do what's right for the community. And I think, like Board President Walton says, that means increasing funding to make sure that the city is monitoring these things as well, that it's not being left just to the Navy or to a private contractor, that we're staying on top of these things. And when it comes to the flooding that was highlighted in the report, that we're working with organizations like SF Port that already has lots of research and. Uh, reports and things investigating to the concern that might come from flooding, whether that's from a tsunami or just over time from climate change. We can kind of pull these resources together, make sure everything is talking to one another, and make sure that as we clean the shipyard that the community stays safe. Thank you. Question 19, what are your plans to address air quality issues in your community, especially neighborhoods that are adjacent to industrialized areas? Brian. That's a great question. I think when it comes to air quality, it's very unfortunate for District 10 that we have two freeways and some major expressways cutting through the neighborhood. 
for people that are living near 101 and 280, a lot of people, myself included, kind of sucks. Um, I think when it comes to car pollutants, one thing we might see is by expanding support for public transit and making people more willing to ride a bus, we might have less car smog and expose people to less pollutants there. I think when it comes to construction and when it comes to contaminants that are inside the environment from decades of neglect and maybe bad practices from our forefathers, it comes in making sure that we stick to the rules, that we're not streamlining or cutting red tape for the red tape that kind of protects our lives and protects our health. So making sure that, you know, uh, dirt at a construction site is covered or watered so that people aren't being exposed to this working with the Bay Area quali air quality management so that we are notified, they already notify us, but making sure that the community knows when there's potential risks and just expanding these services that, so that we, we know all we need to know and we're working to keep these agencies accountable so that we can reduce our exposure to potential contaminants, whether they're smog from cars or other kinds of pollutants like dirt or other fine particles or things coming from some of the industrial businesses that are located in the Bayview or along Cesar Chavez. Thank you, Shaman. What we are doing is working on providing air filtration devices for individual homes, uh, particularly in some of our more isolated and disenfranchised communities, our public housing communities. We are in the middle of securing resources to do that. Uh, we've done this for some of our sites that provide shelter for people experiencing homelessness because we know how important it is to have those. And one of the things that is making it difficult because we want to also make sure that we have the best type of air filtration devices in homes. Uh, some are less, in, less expensive, but most certainly not always the best. And so we're working to make sure that we put the best products in the home that are really going to protect people. Uh, we also have provided cease and desist orders to businesses that are polluting in our, 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 our communities and in our neighborhoods. That's an important tool that we have in place working with the city attorney. We've actually shut some businesses down for that. We're going to continue to utilize that enforcement authority that we have. Of course, being a part of the barrier quality management district, making sure they stay on top of permitting and making sure the best practices to keep our air, air uh, clean and to make sure that we stop pollution going out into our environment are the things that we'll continue to do. And being on, serving on that body has really helped me to be able to do that. Uh, we also are continuing to work on ways to provide quality public and alternative transportation because we know the more robust public transportation is, the less cars we're going to have on the street. And of course, that is going to support improving our air quality. Thank you. And now question 20, our last question. In 2021, overdose deaths decreased slightly for the first time in three years. This period coincided with Narcan resuscitations ramping up significantly to almost 6,000. Do you have any plans to look into making Narcan more affordable and accessible for our community? Shaman. So definitely, one, want to make sure that Narcan is available to all of our service providers and quite frankly, even to individuals in, in community. Uh, we've seen Nar Narcan work and save dozens of lives. A lot of our nonprofit providers have Narcan and they are able to be on site and help support individuals who overdose in community. And so 100% support, uh, one, making Narcan easier to afford, providing the resources for more of our organizations and members of community to have Narcan. But also, we need to make sure that we do get a safe consumption site in a place where people who are struggling with drug addiction, who want to, to change but need more support right now, are in an environment where they're receiving help, receiving support, so the, the chance and possibility of an overdose, overdose is very slim uh, versus some of what we see right now where people are, are, are out on the streets and in community, and unfortunately, because of, 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 of addiction, they're forced to be out on the street and use in certain areas, and it's unsafe for them because they're not in an environment where people are there to support them and make sure that if something happens, um, they will be able to, to be safe. And so 100% around increasing resources to buy more Narcan as well as making it uh, more less, less expensive for, for people to use because it really does save lives. Thank you. Brian. I think, again, I agree. We obviously want to expand support for availability of Narcan, but we want to avoid these emergencies in the first place because we want these resources available so that in case there is an emergency, someone can respond. When we look at other kinds of health crises, like a heart attack, 
most of the time, if you just give someone CPR, if you try to give them chest compressions, without a defibrillator, you know, their chances are you know, 20% at best. But once you defibrillate them, the chances of you being able to recess resuscitate someone who's experiencing a heart attack go up to maybe like 80%. So in the same way, we need that Narcan to save people that may be experiencing an overdose. But there are other ways to protect them. Like Board President Walton mentioned, having safe consumption sites brings people out of more dangerous condi conditions. Their drugs can be tested, they can be monitored for their safety, and they can be brought into wraparound services to help them deal with drug addiction, mental health issues, or any other problems they may be facing. As long as they remain on the streets or they're potentially uh, they're in using drugs, maybe in unsafe environments without supervision, increases that risk. Bringing them into supervision, bringing them into a safe environment helps to reduce that risk, reduce the number of drug overdoses that are happening in San Francisco. Thank you. Now we come to the candidates' closing statements. We will be doing the closing statements in reverse alphabetical order. And remember that you have 90 seconds. Shaman. Thank you. So first, I just want to thank the League of Women Voters for conducting this forum tonight, all of you for attending. I want to thank Brian for, for stepping up and wanting to be civically involved. I think it's important that people do that. And so my hat goes off to him for being willing to put himself out there because I know how it is to run for office. At the end of the day, I am the type of supervisor that is going to continue to spend time in community, listen to concerns and needs, and make sure that they are addressed. One of the things I think most of you in this room know, I am very responsive. My office is very responsive. If you reach out, you will get a response. If you email me, you will get a response from me. It won't be from somebody else, uh, especially when you initially reach out. And we'll have conversations about how to address your concerns. Sometimes we don't always agree on, on solutions, but most certainly I work with you to address your concerns and your needs. I will continue to do that. I will continue to be accessible, continue to be available, but most importantly, we'll continue to get results for our district and make sure that the district improves, that we have what we need, not only here in District 10, but also across the city. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be elected by my colleagues to serve as the president of the Board of Supervisors, which I think is a testament to one, not only us having the ability to get things done, but also the ability to work with everyone. As you know, we face some difficult decisions. Everybody doesn't agree here in San Francisco, but we are happy and proud to be in a position where we bring people together to address your issues, and I would love for your support on November Thank 8th. you. Now, Brian. Sure. I also wanted to thank the League of Women Voters and also everyone in the audience for their coming out to listen to us both speak and thanking Board President Walton for his kind words. I think for myself, for many people here, it's probably the first time you may be hearing from me, but I hope it's not the last. Uh, for myself, I just want to bring someone that is, I, I want to be someone running that is committed to the community, that is committed to the diversity of District 10, and I believe that this has been reflected in my continued commitment to showing up in community and constantly finding new ways to bring my set of skills or just being there for people in community. I think also, for myself at least, bringing a lot of attention to sustainability, the climate, and public transit in the city. I think it's just something we give a lot of lip service without thinking about what, the reality, what that reality means for people on the ground. You know, whether people want to ride the bus or not, or ride the train or not, and trying to make it a desirable thing, trying to make it the safe, convenient thing to get more people riding public transit or riding a bike, feeling safe enough to ride a bike, feeling safe enough to walk in the city. I know for myself, the city runs on cars. There's 400,000 cars in the city. And for myself, I just want to see the city being more sustainable, being a more walkable, more livable place. And I think with that, we'll bring more safety, more jobs, more opportunities in the city. And uh, thanks again for your time. Thank you. Well, on behalf of myself and the League of Women Voters of San Francisco, our thanks to the candidates for participating. And thanks to each of you for taking the time to inform yourself about your choices on November 8th. Please remember to register to vote if you aren't already registered and urge others to register. If you change your name or you've moved, you need to register again at your new address. And if you will be voting by mail this year, please be sure that your vote will count by ensuring that your ballot is mailed or dropped off at a polling place or voting center early. 
Good evening.